Hey there, Cognitive Psych students. It's Dr. Gilchrist. Um, so this week, uh, for this last week of lectures, we are going to finish up our discussion of language. Uh, we're going to finish talking about reading, and then we're going to briefly touch on language comprehension. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple because for most of you, uh, if you're feeling pretty good with how you did on the last three exams and you don't really need to take the final, um, the only time you're going to see language pop up is on your quizzes. Um, but for those of you who are planning on taking the final, I do want to briefly touch on comprehension because some language aspects are going to pop up there. And so I want to make sure that you're prepared. All right, so the last time that we were here, we were talking about one of my favorite cognitive psychology studies, looking at the interaction uh, between uh, semantic relationships and uh, expectancy in terms of um, reading and processing information uh, based off of a study by Neely in 1977. And as I went over, one of the things that we tend to see is that for uh, semantic relatedness, that is something that is almost immediately and automatically facilitated, indicating a much more automatic process. Uh, comparatively, um, divorced from uh, semantic relationships, expectancy, what we expect to see is going to be a little bit more controlled as we kind of saw with these two center lines. Uh, so here's semantic relationship, but unexpected, which shifts from very early faci uh, facilitation to later inhibition, indicating a controlled process taking over versus um, expected but semantically unrelated, um, starting with almost no facilitation and then increasing over time. Um, so continuing down this route, we have to talk about the role that context plays in all of this because context can often give us a pretty good idea of what we should be expecting. So um, how much does context actually matter when we're reading? And one of the things that we find is that um, like semantic processing, context is something that we take into account very, very early. Lucas back in 1999 found that when we're reading a word, um, the context appropriate meaning uh, actually produces more target priming. It's something we focus on more than other potential meanings. Um, now, here's what's kind of interesting, though. This does seem to interplay with frequency. Um, so when you hear the word flower, most people tend to think of the flower that grows in a garden rather than the flower that you bake with. So flower here is a higher frequency homophone and is thus a more dominant homophone than flower that we bake with, which is a non-dominant meaning. What's kind of interesting is that frequency does seem to play a role here. We actually tend to fixate on the dominant meanings of homophones, such as flower that grows in a garden, uh, even when the context actually supports a non-dominant meaning. So context matters, but frequency seems to interplay with context and in some cases might actually take precedence over context. So now we're going to move on to talking about reading out loud. Okay. All right. Ah, why won't you work? Huh? Eh? Huh? Uh, you'll have to forgive me. My computer actually just randomly paused. So uh, now we're going to talk about reading out loud. Now, this is something that we actually do pretty easily, despite the fact that at least for the English language, we've got some really interesting things going on. So if we go through and read all of these, um, so we're going to go through. So we've got cat, fog, comb, which we read pretty easily, despite the fact that it has a silent B and is not comb. Um, pint, which is kind of surprising. This is an irregular pronunciation. Uh, we are pronouncing this with a long I rather than a short I, such as in hint. Um, so hint is a more regular pronunciation. This is an irregular pronunciation, but we do it pretty easily. 
And then we have pseudo words like mantiness and fast. And uh, that's how I am choosing to pronounce those. You might have chosen something a little bit differently. So there are a couple of different ways that we can think about reading. And so what we're looking at here is referred to as the dual root cascaded model. Um, your textbook refers to this as the DRC model. Um, both of those are totally acceptable. But the dual root cascaded model uh, basically says that reading words, whether they are regular pronunciations or irregular pronunciations, as well as reading non-words, involve slightly different processes. And some of these processes are rule-based and some of them are not. Now this looks like a really complicated model, but what the model is basically doing is it is demonstrating three potential different routes to being able to read and produce speech in certain cases, or convert this into a speech-based code that we actually understand. So taking it from print to actually reading it uh, out loud. So here are some of the major assumptions of the dual root cascaded model um, before we get into more about how the model works. So first of all, the model does assume a weak phonological model. Uh, as we learned about last week, a weak phonological model is basically the idea that you do not necessarily have to know what a sound or, or what a word sounds like to be able to read it. So this model assumes that you don't necessarily have have to have access to phonological information if you want to be able to read the word. Um, you can use what is called a non-lexical root, which is root one, which is called the uh, grapheme to phoneme conversion root, um, or we can use uh, lexical word-based paths, uh, so root two, which utilizes a semantic system, versus root three, which utilizes solely uh, an orthographic to phonological system. So we've got these three different roots. Um, naming visually presented words is often to be assumed to be based on the lexical root. And here's what's really critical. Um, so this kind of indicates a parallel process rather than a serial process. So the idea is that while I am engaging in analyzing what the word looks like, what we would call an orthographic analysis, um, the activation is already starting to cascade to other levels. So even though I'm not quite done with this stage of the analysis, these other stages are beginning to start. So this is part of the reason why reading occurs relatively quickly for us because it's not purely a serial model. So activation is gonna start moving forward to other steps before you've finished a particular stage of the process. So I'm going to try to keep these uh, three different roots very, very simple for you. So let's go on and uh, discuss what these are. So the first root is basically grapheme to phoneme conversion. So we're going to focus on what the word looks like. When we talk about a grapheme, we are talking about how something is spelled. And then we're going to base that into what the word sounds like. So root one is a grapheme to phoneme conversion. It ultimately converts spelling into sound. And this root is incredibly important for reading irregular words like pint, words that do not look like how they sound, or words that are typically pronounced um, that are typically pronounced differently from how you would expect them. So here are some other really common irregular words that you might encounter on a, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, laugh. So it definitely doesn't look like how it sounds. One, bear, B-E-A-R. When we have words like deer and here, that's how we normally pronounce it, but the word bear is actually an irregular pronunciation. Um, door. Um, eight, shoe, the, there, two, uh, were, uh, and your. So these are pretty common irregularly uh, pronounced words. Um, and some evidence that there is some grapheme to, um, 
grapheme dephonine conversion, the evidence of root one, uh, basically comes from people who have surface dyslexia. So um, it has been suggested that surface dyslexia is basically causing problems with root one. So what this means is that these people will be able to read non-words, they will be able to read regular words pretty well, but they have a particular problem with irregular words because they can't do the spelling to sound conversion. So for example, a patient KT, which was a reported patient with surface dyslexia, had 100% non-word reading accuracy, about 81% regular word accuracy, and basically 41% uh, irregular word accuracy. Uh, in particular, KT would make what are called regularization errors so he would probably this patient would potentially pronounce a bear as beer um, because it's spelled deer here um, and so thus bear should be beer that is a regularization error we're basically trying to pronounce an irregular word in the regular way now people that have semantic dementia uh, have been reported to often display uh, surface dyslexia as well. So um, they engage in these errors of overregularization. So the next root is a lexical root. Um, and by a lexical root, we mean that we are storing information in what is referred to as a lexicon. A lexicon is basically your mind's version of a dictionary. So you basically have a dictionary for all of the possible uh, visual presentations of words that you've encountered. And then from that input into the lexicon, um, that activates the meaning, and then you have a phonological output lexicon. So basically, this is a giant dictionary where if I have the input from what the word looks like, I can figure out what the meaning of the word is, and I can figure out how to pronounce the word, just as a regular dictionary does. And um, so basically the idea here in this model is we go into orthographic analysis, we focus on what the word looks like, we then go to that input lexicon, we figure out what the word means, and then we uh, get the pronunciation and then basically read the word out loud. Um, some evidence that we might have for root two, so utilizing both the lexicon and the semantic system, comes from phonological dyslexia. So whereas with surface dyslexia, um, the problem is with only irregular words, phonological dyslexia occurs when people have um, problems reading unfamiliar words and non-words. And this is largely because of um, that grapheme phoneme conversion. They solely have to rely on root two. So um, because they are only relying on root two, that means that they'll have an easy time with words that they've already encountered because it's already in the lexicon. But if they've never seen a word, it's not in the lexicon. If it's a non-word, it's not in the lexicon. So people with phonological dyslexia can't, can only make use of the lexicon. They can't do the grapheme to phoneme conversion. They have issues with phonology. And so because of that, um, they have to rely solely on root two or root three. Um, and some evidence from this back in 1979 from Beauvoir and Derenay, um, and I'm probably mangling that pronunciation, uh, is from 1979. They reported a patient RG who could only read about 10% of non-words. Non-words aren't gonna be in the lexicon and because they're not in the lexicon, um, you aren't really going to have a lot of idea how to pronounce them. So root three is really not that different from root two, except we are bypassing the semantic system. So this is a case where we get what the word looks like, we go to the lexicon, we immediately get the pronunciation uh, from the output lexicon and basically read the word. So everything's the same, except we're just not accessing meaning. So I want to briefly talk about another form of dyslexia. This is what is referred to as deep dyslexia. So this is a very heavy 
form of phonological dyslexia. Um, not only do they have problems with reading unfamiliar words and non-words, but they also have issues with the semantic system. So these people are probably solely relying on root two. They don't have root one, they don't have root, uh, or rather they're solely relying on root three, not root two. Root two is the semantic system. Um, so they don't have the grapheme to phoneme conversion. They don't have the semantic meaning. So we're going to find that not only do they have the similar problems with phonological dyslexia where they don't have root one, they can't read unfamiliar words or non-words. They have to rely on the lexicon. They also have problems with semantic reading errors. If they see the word chip, they're going to read it as boat. So these people are solely relying on root three. They basically have the uh, orthographic input and then they get the phonological output. They have no grapheme to phoneme conversion. They have no semantic system. And this is largely due to left hemisphere brain damage to different language areas, which means that we're losing our grapheme to phoneme conversion and we're losing our semantic system. And thus, this is a more severe form of a phonological dyslexia. So when we think about this model, um, a couple of things come up. So one of the things that the dual root cascaded model takes into account is that words that are regular um, can solely, um, words that are pretty regular are going to be pronounced more quickly than words that are irregular. And so uh, one of the things that is not clear is whether or not um, pronunciation time in reading out loud is due to the word being more regular or the word being used consistently. Um, additionally, there is some evidence that shows that phonological processing of visually presented words is actually much more rapid or much more automatic than this model assumes. Um, additionally, um, there's talk about the semantic aspects of this model, but there's not really a lot of discussion of what role it plays here, and it's not really implemented very well. I think it's an interesting model. I know it looks scary. Hopefully it looks less scary um, now that we've kind of talked about it, but there's a lot that we don't fully understand about this model. So another model um, that has been utilized is what is referred to as the distributed connectionist approach. And if we're talking about connectionism, Jay McClelland is somebody who comes up quite a bit. Um, and in this case, um, what you kind of see here is that meaning so the semantic aspects as well as context, orthography, so what the word looks like, and phonology, what the word sounds like, these are all connected. All information is used to read both words and non-words. So these are all kind of connected to each other. Um, now, what's really critical here is that non-words vary in terms of consistency. And so both words and non-words vary in consistency. What's really important here is consistency over regularity. And in your textbook on page 334, they actually kind of talk about the difference between consistency and regularity. So grapheme to phoneme consistency is basically um, more important here. Consistency is basically, is this sequence of letters always pronounced the same? So if I have A-K-E at the end of a word, is that um, A-K-E, is that always going to be pronounced the same no matter what sequence of letters are immediately behind that? or in front of that. Um, regularity is basically, does this sequence of letters produce the correct pronunciation according to a set of rules? So um, regularity basically will predict that regular words will be pronounced equally quickly regardless of whether or not the word is consistent. Hint um, should be produced as equally quickly as the word husk, but pint will take longer than the consistent word uh, puss. Um, consistency, on the other hand, is going to predict that it takes longer to pronounce hint over husk because hint is inconsistent, uh, despite the fact that it's irregular, 
It is a regular pronunciation, but husk is not only always regular, but it's always consistent. So this is what's really critical here. Um, additionally, this model uh, specifies that semantic knowledge has the longest impact on inconsistent words because of the longer processing time. So how this model kind of works is that written words are going to activate these orthographic nodes. They're going to send their information to phonological nodes, and eventually those will go to more semantic nodes. Um, note that there's no lexicon. Um, and there's not uh, um, there's not rules for grapheme to phoneme conversion. Uh, basically, what you're trying to do is you are trying to produce the proper output, what you're going to read, uh, by adjusting the weights between the nodes uh, during training. So this is kind of the idea. All of this information is available, and uh, really, this is a little less complicated uh, than the DRC model. So when we simulate the model, uh, the performance of the network very closely uh, approximates that of adult readers. Um, again, this model emphasizes consistency over regularity, and we do actually find that consistent and high frequency or more common words are named faster. Um, Generally, we do find that there is an interaction between word frequency and consistency. And additionally, um, when words are less common, we find that consistency plays a greater role. So for words that are very, very low in frequency, words that are not common, we tend to find that consistency plays a greater role in we whether or not that word can be read and pronounced properly. Uh, if a word is more common and more frequent, such as the word the, which is not a very consistent or regular word at all, um, it doesn't really matter how consistent consistent it is because it's common. But when a word is rare, consistency starts to matter more. And this model actually manages to pronounce about 90% of words correctly. So that's pretty good. Um, here is some additional evidence. So one of the things that we do find is that if you reduce the activation to semantic nodes, it actually looks like a surface dyslexia. Um, additionally, there is some evidence that phonological dyslexics may also suffer from orthographic impairments, which means that the problem is not just, um, it kind of fits with that idea that converting what a word looks like into what it sounds like is a problem. Um, generally, we do find that inconsistent nonwords are going to take uh, longer to pronounce than consistent ones, and we do see more variability in pronunciation. So once again, consistency seems to matter more than regularity. And inconsistent items, we tend to find that reading aloud is faster when the semantic system also plays a role. Um, but semantics don't really matter as much when items are consistent. So when words are consistent, we don't really need very much to help read those things because it's consistent. When words are inconsistent, we're probably going to need some additional help, such as the context or the semantics, to get us to read that word appropriately. So when we think about this approach, um, there is a lot of evidence that supports the notion that or the orthographic con uh, things, the phonological things, and the semantic things all kind of operate in parallel. The dual root cascaded model is not perfectly parallel. Um, you have to finish a process before all of that activation can spread to a future step. Um, so this tends to run in parallel. There's a greater emphasis on semantics than the DRC model. Um, there's also a greater emphasis on consistency. And it also includes an explicit learning mechanism because it is a computational model that seems to do a pretty good job of explaining how people learn. Um, once again, um, we don't really have a very good understanding of what this would look like for more complicated words. We don't really get a lot of talk about how semantics really plays a role in this or how it's instantiated. And additionally, what role does attention play in all this? It might just play a role in reading, and that's not something that's really talked about here. 
So let's move on to talking about eye tracking. So one of the things that you might find kind of interesting, and I'm just going to make this bigger for a second so that you can see me. Um, I'm going to uh, read something on my phone really quick. I'm going to take off my glasses and I want you to kind of see uh, what my eyes do as I read. Okay, now I hope you were able to capture some of that. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that just because we think that we operate in a certain way, um, that is not actually what our data show us. So one of the things that's interesting is that when you watch somebody read, um, when you're reading, you think that your eyes are moving very smoothly from left to right, left to right, left to right, and your eyes just go in a line like this. Um, if you looked at me reading, um, or if you film somebody reading, or if you watch somebody else reading, you'll notice that's not what their eyes actually do at all. What their eyes do is they take these little jerky jumps. They jump around. They basically, so we start here on my left. So we go here and we fixate for a little bit. We jump, we fixate for a little bit. So we're not moving smoothly. We're taking these jerky little jumps. And research has kind of shown that these jerky little jumps are the ways that we gain information because some of the words that we read are gonna be more important than others. And thankfully we have things like eye tracking where a camera actually tracks your eye movements as you're reading something to help us figure out what people are doing when they read. So we actually end up looking at saccades. So those jerky little jumps that your eyes do when you read are what are known as saccades. Your eyes do not move smoothly as they read a page. These are rapid little jerks. And uh, one of the things that we find is that they are ballistic in nature, which what this means is that once we initiate that movement, the direction cannot be changed. So if I start moving in this direction, I can't move backwards or in another direction until that movement is completely done. So it kind of works like a ballistic missile. Um, generally, a saccade takes about uh, 20 to 30 milliseconds. Uh, this basically adds up to about eight letters or eight spaces, and they're separated by these little fixations where we stop for about 250. 200 to 250 milliseconds. It is not the saccades that we get information from. It is the longer fixations between the um, saccades that is where we get our information. So one of the ways that we can actually look at how saccades work and where we fixate is by doing what is called a moving window technique. Um, so what we do is we hook somebody up to an eye tracker and we have people read things on a computer screen and the eye tracker is constantly getting information about where eyes are going and they're basically sending that information to the computer. As you read and as your eyes move, uh, the computer, based on the information it's getting from your eyes, is going to basically block out parts of text and try to keep up with what is called your perceptual span. Um, so as, um, as your eyes move, um, your perceptual span is going to move as well. So one of the things that we find uh, for left to right languages, if we're talking about right to left languages, such as Hebrew, this is gonna be reversed. First. but our effective field of view as we read, so here's our fixation, we do fixate a little bit backwards. We need to know where we've been, but that's only about three to four letters uh, to the left of our fixation, but it's up to 15 letters to the right, which means we're already beginning to anticipate what is coming next before we make our next saccade. One of the other things that we're going to find is that when we are making our saccades, we tend to focus more on major content words and we focus far, far less on function words such as articles like a, an, or the. Um, so we tend to focus more on major nouns and major verbs in a sentence rather than those other function words. 
So as I kind of mentioned, we tend to focus about 80% of our fixations are on content words, about 20% is on function words. And what's actually kind of interesting is that this is partially based on attention. Part of the reason that we know this is because we have something called uh, the spillover effect. Fixation time on a word. We actually spend more time on a word if it was immediately preceded by a rare word that we're not used to seeing. It's almost like the rare word captures our attention and then some of that spills over into our next fixation as a result. So some people have kind of taken this eye tracking information and the information that we get from fixation and they've developed something called the easy reader model. And this is basically where we're going to end this part of the lecture. So here's how the easy reader model works. So we've made our saccade, we're fixating, and we're basically going to check to see whether the word is familiar. Um, once we and so we're not only going to check the familiarity, we're going to be checking its frequency. So a word that is more frequent is going to be more familiar. As we're engaging in this frequency checking, that is going to signal our eyes to get ready to make the next saccade. Um, after we do that frequency check, we are going to engage in the second stage of lexical axis. We're going to focus on the semantic and the phonological forms of the word. We're then going to take our, our saccade and shift our attention to the next word. So this is basically how the easy reader, reader model works. We look at our word, we say, how common is this? How frequent is this? We start focusing on what the word means, what it sounds like, and then we move on to the next one. Now, some other assumptions that we have with this model, um, generally frequency checking and the lexical access, such as getting the semantics, getting the phonology, these are gonna be completed more for uh, common words, of course. Uh, frequency checking should be fast for a word that is more frequent. Um, and we're gonna find this is faster for common words than for rare ones. But that seems to be um, more affecting getting the semantics and the phonology than for the frequency checking itself. Re additionally, this process will go much faster for words that are predictable. Um, we are processing the context of a sentence as we read and we do make predictions than for unpredictable words. So if I say, um, she went to the uh, farmer's market and bought a nice boot. Nobody expects to buy a, a boot at a farmer's market. You're going to spend more time focusing on that boot because it's more unpredictable than she went to the farmer's market and got a nice watermelon. So when we test the easy reader model, so here we are getting look from Rakel and colleagues back in 1998. Here we have word frequency. So higher levels mean more common words, um, lower levels mean less common words. And you can kind of see that in general, um, and this is especially true for um, lexical access, lexical access really dives the more common a word is. Notice how high it is in terms of uh, time between successive eye movements uh, when a word is very, very rare. Now, of course, you can see that all of these things, whether the eye movement or the lexical access and processing the next word and the familiarity check, all of them take longer, the less common a word is. But this drop with more frequent words is especially dramatic for lexical access. You can see that the slope of this line is completely different than what you would see for eye movement and the familiarity check. And that's pretty interesting. Now, there are some limitations of the easy reader model. It's mostly focusing on, is it frequent? What does it sound like? What does it mean? Context does play a role here, but we don't really talk a lot about those higher level processes or uh, predictability. Um, additionally, um, this is assumed to be a serial process, and there's a lot of evidence that a lot of the reading aspects we do with reading 
are in parallel. They're not serial. Additionally, these durations in fixation are much better explained by predictability and whether or not a word fits within the current context rather than how frequent or how common a word is. So I believe that is all I had for reading. So we'll go ahead and stop here and I will see you next time to talk about language comprehension. Bye. Eh, come on, you.